It's Tuesday, the 30th of August. My name is Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And just yesterday on the 29th of August, the Australian Transport Safety Bureau finally released their final report on the loss of tanker 134, the Colson C-130 in Australia back in January of 2020. Let's check it out. I'm finally getting caught up to real time after a very busy summer here at the Blanco Lirio Global Headquarters. And the best way for you to remain up to speed as to what's happening here on the Blanco Lirio channel is to subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's free. And then hit this all notifications bell here on YouTube. But that doesn't necessarily get you all the notifications depending on how popular a video is in the algorithms of YouTube. The sure bet to make sure you get everything is to join me over here on Patreon where I post all my stuff early and ad free over on Patreon. It's only as little as two bucks a month gets you in and it gets you access to all of these posts ad free and you can help join the conversation over here on Patreon as well. There's a lot of misconceptions out there about the use of air power in fighting forest fires, not only amongst the general public, but amongst the flying population as well, and often administrators of these programs. I spent a year training up to be a bird dog pilot, as they call it in Australia, or a lead plane pilot, as we call it here in the United States, and learned a great deal about this, this program and its very unique characteristics. One of the first things to understand about the effective use of aerial retardant is that air tankers, air power alone, cannot put out the fire. You are only using retardant to retard the spread of the flames, to slow the fire down until the troops on the ground can draw a proper containment line around the fire and contain and or stop the fire. The air tankers do not put out the fire. Here's a good example of a very recent fire in right near our neighborhood where the Cal Fire S2Ts, you can see the retardant just on the outside of some dozer lines that helped the ground troops corral this fire and kept this small fire small. That being said, there are definite limitations to the use of air tankers, especially when it comes to the wind and weather. When the winds get much above 25 to 30 miles an hour, the effectiveness of this retardant is greatly reduced. It's virtually ineffective once the winds really pick up. Besides, it's much too hazardous to fly these low-level missions in windy conditions which include wind shear when you're operating this close to the ground. And what this final report proves is what I've been saying all along about this accident. There was no reason for this air crew to be operating at all during the day of this accident because of the extremely windy conditions that were occurring at the time of this accident and the associated wind shear that took down this aircraft and killed three crew members. Now we're going to go through and read this summary of this report together. On 23 January of 2020, the crew of a Lockheed Corporation EC-130Q large air tanker registered as November 134 Charlie Gulf were conducting brush fire control operations in the snowy mountain region near New South Wales. After assessing the initial fire retardant drop site at Adaminibi as not suitable, the crew accepted an alternate tasking to the good good peak view fire ground. After conducting a partial retardant drop at peak view, that was a half a load, the aircraft was in a left turn and climbed for about 10 seconds to 170 feet above drop height. Following this, the aircraft was then observed descending. The aircraft was seen at a very low height above the ground and a slight left bank immediately followed by a significant left roll just before ground impact. The three crew were fatally injured and the aircraft destroyed. Now we're going to be reviewing a lot of important details found within this report, but not until we review this summary. What the ATSB found. The ATSB found that the forecast and actual weather conditions present in the snowy mountains were hazardous, with strong gusting winds and mountain wave activity producing turbulence. This was likely exacerbated by the fire in local terrain. Subsequently, the ATSB determined that the conditions were conducive to wind shear and downdraft development at a time when the aircraft was most vulnerable. 
with low airspeed and at low altitude right after the drop. Despite an awareness of these conditions that, and that all other fire control aircraft, including a Boeing 737 large air tanker, were not operating in the area at the time due to these weather conditions, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, which will be referred to as RFS in this report, continued with their tasking of 134 Charlie Gulf to Adaminabe without aerial supervision. The bird dog, the lead plane, no lead plane. You'll find out in a minute here that the lead plane pilot refused the the tasking before he even left the ground he refused the tasking because he was aware of the current conditions in addition they relied on the pilot in command to assess the appropriateness of the tasking but did not provide them all the available information to make an informed decision on flight safety that information for the tasking at adamitabee adamitabee should have included details about the actual hazardous environment conditions resulting in the cessation of local aerial operations. The bird dog pilot declining the tasking due to the weather forecast conditions and the report of the 737 crew that the conditions precluded them from returning to the fire ground. In other words, it is believed that tanker 134 did not get the information that not only did the bird dog refuse the, the assignment, but the 737 returned from their assignment and said they were not going back. Now remember, this C-130 crew is what's called initial attack qualified. Normally, when you're operating with large air tankers like these C-130s, you almost always here in the States fly with a lead plane. But there are certain crews that are initial attack qualified that do not, that do not require the service of a lead plane in order to drop on a fire. So nonetheless, the pilot in command of 134 Charlie Gulf accepted the tasking to the Adaminabe fire ground which was subject to the hazardous environmental conditions. After assessing the, the conditions as unsuitable at Adaminabe, they accepted the tasking to good good with the same fire weather conditions. The acceptance of these taskings were consistent with the operator's practice to depart and assess the conditions to find a workable solution rather than rely solely on weather forecast, which may or may not necessarily reflect the actual conditions at the fire ground. Again, he's initial attack qualified, so he is allowed to go out there and find out for himself what the conditions actually are like. At the good good fire ground, following a partial retardant drop and left turn, that's that half load, the aircraft was very likely subjected to hazardous environmental conditions, including low level wind shear and an increasing tailwind component. From a combination of witness video and real-time position and flight path data, which we'll review, it was established that the aircraft's climb performance degraded. Subsequently, while at a low height and airspeed, it was likely that the aircraft aerodynamically stalled, resulting in a collision with the terrain. In the limited time available, the remainder of the fire retardant load was not jettisoned prior to the aircraft stalling. That's rule number one in air tanker operations. Anytime you're in trouble, somebody's got to reach up there and hit that emergency dump on the aircraft. Each of these tankers have an emergency dump switch, not only located right there conveniently for the pilot on the yoke, but also right there on the center console of a C-130 where either crew position, the co-pilot or the flight engineer can reach up there and hit that emergency dump. But things were happening so quickly, this accident occurred within a matter of seconds after the drop, that nobody got the last bit of that load out of that aircraft. And there's another aggravating circumstance we'll talk about in a moment regarding the drop system. It is critical that crews can differentiate between a low risk and a high risk flight during the planning stages as to establish the overall risk profile. These guys are used to this, the risk matrix and um, this, they made a big deal out of the pre-flight risk matrix. Moving on, there are a number of mitigators for wind shear, including pilot training procedures and airborne detection systems. However, Colson Aviation did not include a wind shear recovery procedure in their C-130 airplane flight manual. Further, it was noted that a briefing on wind shear recovery was incorporated in the trailing, into the training syllabus, but there was no requirement to conduct a simulator-based low-level wind shear recovery scenario. In the airline part 121 world, we are subject to this training scenario, the low-level wind shear training scenario every year. But it's hard to get this done in, a, in an older C-130. They're just not equipped 
up to the modern standards of 121 wind shear avoidance technology. Combined, these strategies could provide crews with the experience needed to recognize the, sympt the symptoms of wind shear and practice a recovery procedure. In addition, Colson Aviation had not assessed their fleet of C-130 aircraft for fitment of a wind shear detection system. This increased the risk of a wind shear encounter and or delayed, delayed response to an encounter. And we'll get into that in, in detail here in a minute. While the New South Wales RFS was not an aviation organization or directly responsible for flight safety, they were closely involved in the aerial operation, being responsible for determining the task objectives and selecting aircraft for the task. Remember, it's ultimately up to the pilot in command whether he wants to take on the task or not. The ATSB found that the RFS had limited large air tanker policies and procedures for aerial supervision requirements and no procedures for deployment without aerial supervision, without a bird dog, without a lead plane. In addition, they did not have a policy or procedure in place to manage task rejections. If somebody says, I don't want to go, the conditions are too bad, they didn't have a system in place of letting everybody know that that had occurred. Nor to communicate this information internally or to other pilots working in the same area of operation. Such policies and associated procedures would provide frontline personnel with the required steps to effectively and safely manage taskings and provide guidance for decision making. If that guy ain't going, I ain't going either. It was also identified that while not applicable to the accident crew, the RFS procedure allowed aircraft operators to determine when pilots were initial attack capable. So there's some discrepancy there as to how do you determine who is initial attack qualified in Australia versus here in the United States. And finally, while not contributing to the accident, the aircraft's cockpit voice recorder did not record the accident flight. They had one on board. It was not required that they have one on board per the contract, but they did have one, but it did not unfortunately capture the accident flight. So we're missing a lot of data about how the crew worked together as a team or did not possibly work together as a team up to the moments leading to this accident. Unfortunately, in aviation, it takes large accidents like this to affect change with inside the industry. And as a result of this accident, Colson is already working on getting a wind shear recovery procedure into their C-130 flight manuals. They are also changing their pre-flight risk assessment. And it sounds like they are also in getting their cockpit voice recorders such that they work prior to each flight. And then finally, they're changing up their retardant aerial delivery system software so that it does not require rearming between partial load drops where the load is less than 100%. We'll talk about more in that in a minute in detail. Meanwhile, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service told the ATSB that they intend to do the following, commission an independent report into the management of airspace in which aircraft are operating in support of firefighting activities, formalize and establish a large air tanker coordinator role description to be positioned at the state air desk, undertake an immediate audit in conjunction with operators of pilots qualified as initial attack capable and ensure those records are correct, undertake a detailed research to identify the best practice relating to task rejection and aerial supervision policies and procedures, as well as initial attack training and certification. Undertake a comprehensive review of our FS aviation doctrine to incorporate outcomes of the above mentioned research. Promulgate the revised doctrine detailing the task rejection policies and procedures. And this is all to be reinforced at the aviation operators briefing held annually prior to bushfire season and provide the national Aerial Firefighting Center and National Firefighting Agencies with copies of all this data. Hopefully, the New South Wales RFS will come on up here to the states. Specifically, I would recommend North Ops here in Northern California and see how the operation is run up here and do a little inner service um, checking out of how things are done here locally and hopefully take home some real good ideas of how to help coordinate all this and get it done. Now onto the accident itself. Remember the lead plane has rejected the call to go out. The 737 dropped it at Aminabee and said, we're not going back. He went back to base. And so the C-130 headed over to 
this area to drop here. Following the accident, the ATSB received multiple witness reports of the weather conditions at peak view. They consistently reported very strong winds from the northwest with gusts up to 43 knots recorded at ground level. About 12 minutes prior to the accident, a local weather station indicated a wind speed of 25 knots gusting to 39 knots from a direction of 3 to 0 degrees. A personal weather station at peak view about 1.3 miles from the accident recorded uh, seven minutes prior to the accident a mean wind of 15 knots from the west and a peak gust of 32 knots from the north. So variable, very variable wind conditions. Again, remember, retardant begins to become ineffective much above 25 miles an hour. Now looking at the accident site itself, well, let's go back and look at another view first. Let's look at this view looking, well, north is off to our right. Here's the location of the ground firefighters where that video was shown. Here's the site of the accident. Here's the ri rising terrain surrounding the drop zone. Winds are blowing down hard out of the north and west. So he's basically dropping in a quartering tailwind situation and turning the aircraft into a more of a direct tailwind situation. And he makes a typical left-hand pattern after several orbits, sizing the, up the drop site. He came in for a left-hand drop orbit, started his drop here, ended his drop here, and then struggled to climb away from this drop and then entered slightly rising terrain and crashed right over here. Another view looking straight down from Google Earth with north oriented up. We've got this ridge line here to his, to his west and again, he's making a left-hand orbit. There was that weather station and he's making his drop right in here. And then he crashes into this slightly rising terrain right there. So again, winds coming down strong and variable down off of this high terrain is gonna produce tremendous downdrafts and wind shear on this drop and throughout his exit. Here's a picture of the accident aircraft tanker 134 with its gear down and its flaps deployed with a 4,000 gallon tank system located inside the fuselage. That's a permanent tank system, not modular. Here is a time lapse of the drop as captured by the video. We'll go to a larger screen view here. So he's coming in about 120 knots indicated airspeed, full flaps dropping a half of a load and then begins his escape where he goes from flaps 100 to flaps 50. That's the normal escape procedure in, or the normal post drop procedure in the C-130. And then gets obscured by smoke as this camera crew is located right about here. And then the aircraft begins to descend and then it appears to stall into the rising terrain right here. Now let's look at the data which is derived from SkyTrack, which is a tracking bit of software that's required to be on board the aircraft that can so that the RFS can keep track of the aircraft and record some basic parameters as well as ADSB data. Look at a larger picture of it. So here in green, we have the vertical speed which is derived and here's the drop and here's the time of impact. So he did get a climb established after the drop before descending into the train. The calibrated airspeed shown in orange here shows a bit of an increase in airspeed and then a pretty steady maintaining of airspeed anywhere between, oh, what's that? 110 and 120 knots right in here. Remember, you can stall an aircraft at any attitude and any airspeed, but only one critical angle of attack. So the airspeed is not as critical in this analysis when you've got this much wind shear. The ground speed, it looks like we've got an increase in ground speed. And then we can see the turn of the aircraft. That would be the left turn of the aircraft, which got him into more and more of a tailwind situation as he was turning the aircraft. Altitude and elevation. 
When comparing the GPS data to the ADSB data, they noted this large low pressure spike in the data. Prior to the drop, the ADSB pre pressure altitude was on average about 250 feet above the SkyTrack GPS altitude, which was consistent with the QNH of the day. It was noted, that's the altimeter setting of the day. It was noted that there was a small increase in the ADSB pressure altitude immediately following the drop, and this is consistent with the RAD's tank door closing on previous drops. So as the tank doors close, remember those pressure relief valves that Abby pointed out in their S2 briefing? They, uh, you will see a bump in the pressure inside the fuselage of the C-130. This was consistent with the RAD's tank door closing on previous drops, but this returned to about the 250 foot difference with the GPS based SkyTrack altitude. However, at 131524, the ADSB pressure altitude and the vertical rate began to diverge significantly with a low pressure spike at about 131529. This was identified by an abrupt increase in both the pressure altitude and barometric vertical speed. In comparison, the SkyTrack GPS based derived vertical speed showed a smaller increase, which correlated with the SkyTrack altitude. So they, this is not an anomaly they determined, but they weren't quite sure what caused this. Well, what this is, is this is the wind shear event itself. When you enter a decreasing head wind shear event, you will see a difference or a drop in the barometric pressure. Now let's talk about one of the contributing factors with the RADS tank system that is being changed now by Colson. And in fact, Abby brought this excellent point up in her presentation of her S2 interview on this channel. It's a 4,000 gallon system, but remember you have a choice you could, of either dropping a full load or a half a load or a quarter load, or you could just leave the intervalometer at 100% full load and then determine by how long you push down the button, whether you want a quarter load or a half a load. And as Abby pointed out, she prefers that method of just metering out the amount of retardant that you want dropped with your thumb rather than messing with 100%, a half a load or a quarter load on the intervalometer. And here's why. On this particular system, the RAD system was designed that if less than 100% volume was selected, the system would disarm after a partial load drop and the crew would need to rearm the system to complete further releases. Well, that takes time and attention and you got to remember that in the state of an emergency. It was reported that the crew on Tanker 134 normally selected 100%. The system also included a guarded emergency dump or e-dump switch, and we talked about this, located in reach of all three crew members, which would have fully opened the doors and jettisoned the load regardless of the setting of the rest of the system. But somebody would have to reach up there and turn that, up, turn that on, flip that switch in a very short notice as this accident happened very, very quickly. When you get into these sort of situations, you're getting tunnel vision. You're seeing the ground coming up, rising to you, and your ability to react becomes just very, very limited. And to think outside of the box like that just takes some extraordinary training. The pilot in command was an experienced air tanker pilot. The other, the co-pilot and the flight engineer, though very experienced in the military, this was their very first season in aerial firefighting, an occupation that is considerably different than anything else they had ever done in the military, even though they were working with these same aircraft. The pilot in command had 4,000 hours total, 3,000 hours in the C-130 with 994 air tanker drops. This pilot, it sounds like he started out his career in the Air Force as a flight navigator and then went to pilot training and was also a part of the Air National Guard flying with the MAFS program, the Modular Airborne Firefighting System through the Air National Guard. That's the only kind of training that would really get you primed up for this sort of flying, flying air tankers. If you're already a MAFS pilot, you already know the job pretty well, but you're doing it the military style and this is a contract contractor, not the military. This PIC joined Colson Aviation in 2015 on a part-time basis, became employed full-time in 2017, so he had several years of experience with Colson, the contractor, in flying this C-130. And the sad fact is that he had, just prior 
to this accident, this pilot had resigned his position at Colson Aviation and had already gotten on and a job with uh, CAL FIRE right here in Northern California. The co-pilot had just left the military, it sounds like, 20 years of service flying the C-130, had 1,744 hours, which is about right in the military, especially if you, after 20 years, about after 10 or 15 years active duty, you're going to start flying the desk more than you're going to be flying the airplane. So it's hard to tell how much recent C-130 flying experience this pilot had before joining Colson, but he had about 85 hours um, with Colson, it sounds like, in 28 hours in the last 30 days. So not a lot of firefighting experience. The flight engineer had just joined Colson Aviation in November of 2019 after 25 years in the U.S. military. The flight engineer's check flight was completed on 20 November of 2019. And in, in addition to that flight, the flight engineer had completed just two air tanker drops under supervision in Australia. The aircraft wreckage was examined carefully after the crash and they basically found that there was nothing wrong with the engines or airframe prior to impact. They did find the flaps in the flaps 50 position and I assume they found the gear in the retracted position, though they don't say in this report, as that is the normal condition that you have the aircraft in following a drop. You go from flaps 100 gear retracted to flaps 50 after the drop. It also doesn't say in here what the intervalometer was set to in the RADS tank system, though they do indicate that there was retardant still in the RADS tank in the tank prior to impact. According to the report, the aircraft's emergency climb performance with max power and flaps 50 is about 1,500 feet per minute at 131,000 pounds. With a reduced weight from a jettison of the remaining fire retardant, the emergency climb performance would have increased to about 2,250 feet per minute, about a 50% improvement. And that would have been the absolute best rate of climb that could have been achieved. In other words, if somebody had reached up and dumped that emergency, hit that emergency dump and dumped that last half of that load out of that aircraft, they might have just made it. In the airlines, we've been through wind shear procedures for many, many years. We've developed excellent wind shear detecting systems and wind shear escape maneuvers, which we practice every year in the simulator. And the point, the main point here is that a successful wind shear escape depends on flying the wing. This is a angle of attack driven event. It is not an airspeed driven event because an aircraft can stall at any given airspeed and the airspeed is fluctuating wildly as you fly through the different pressures of the wind shear event. So the basic wind shear escape maneuver that we've developed over the years in the airlines is autopilot, autopilot auto throttles disconnect so that prevents them from ever coming back on you. Throttles full forward. Now this is a bit of a problem in a C-130. You can't just grab all four throttles and jam them full forward you might pitch lock a propeller or cause another sort of problem. That's why you got the flight engineer to help you get the power that you need. Pitch rotate to 15 degrees or follow flight director commands. You're pulling to basically the PLIs, what we call the PLIs, the pitch limit indicators. You're using angle of attack. In the airlines, we have a, an excellent angle of attack indicator, which will come into play and show you exactly where your stalling angle of attack is on your artificial horizon and plus in the airlines you have a stick shaker that you're going to pull to you're probably going to hit that stick shaker several times before you recover from one of these wind shear micro bursts while you're escaping and the only configuration change we do in the airlines is the speed brakes just make sure the speed brakes are retracted we do not mess with retracting flaps or changing configuration or raising or lowering landing gear we leave the configuration alone and just concentrate on flying the aircraft the first officer, or correction, the pilot not flying the aircraft simply calls out the radio altitude, how close you are to the ground and your vertical speed. 250 descending, 200 descending, 150 climbing, 150 climbing, 200 climbing, 250 climbing well. Just like that. You do not call out 
the airspeed. That will just throw you off because what will you tend to do as a pilot? If you see airspeed decreasing, you're going to naturally tend to want to dump the nose down, which is going to mean you're going to hit the ground in one of these wind shear microburst events. Don't get this confused with an engine failure on takeoff. This is a completely different wild, wild beast. You go through one of these wind shear rides every year in the simulator and it's like being thrown into the washing machine and you're within inches well moments of striking the ground because usually this scenario is given to you on approach or on takeoff when you're very low to the ground now back here in the c-130 world they're they've got a little catching up to do with all this technology that's been around for years in the airlines here in 2010, they're suggesting this as a wind shear procedure by Lockheed Martin in the C-130. Announce a go-around, set maximum power, and select go-around flight director mode. If applicable, best initial pitch attitude will be a function of the conditions. If go-around impact is a concern, rotate above the go-around flight director queue as necessary to target threshold speed until safe altitude above the ground is reached. The co-pilot will monitor and call sync rate on the vertical velocity and airspeed as appropriate. I would not recommend calling out airspeed. The navigator engineer will monitor and call out the radio altimeter. That's the important thing. How close are you to the ground? If the flaps are at 100%, transition to 50% flaps after assuring continued positive rate of climb at no lower than obstacle clearance speed. Remember, raising the flaps from 50 from 100 to 50 will increase your stall speed. You've got to be very careful with that. You'll just drop the bottom right out from underneath it. Do not retract the landing gear until recovery is complete with positive rate of climb and increasing train separation. Same thing as the airlines. We don't mess with that configuration. When clear the wind shear, just pitch and power, normal climb out. When conditions report, report the encounter to ATC. And in the fire business, you need to report that to each other. You need to make the call to knock it off. And you need to make that safe calm and report that event. Now, Colson's added some things to their manual now, reminding folks that retracting flaps from 100% to 50% will increase the stall speed. Without proper power and altitude correction, sink rate will also increase. This is particularly noticeable at lower than normal air speeds. If safe altitude and airspeed are not attained, inadvertent touchdown or a stall may occur. And they've also added this. Wind shear may create a severe hazard for aircraft below 1,000 feet. The best defense is to avoid downdrafts altogether as it could be beyond your aircraft's capability. In other words, don't get dispatched out into these conditions. There's no need to. If wind shear is encountered, prop action is required. The recovery requires full power and pitch attitude consistent with a maximum angle of attack for the aircraft. Bingo, they got it. It's an angle of attack problem, not an airspeed problem. You have to fly the wing, max perform that wing out of there. So I'll leave you a link to this report in the description down below. I'll also leave you a link to Captain Warren Vanderberg's excellent discussion on wind shear microburst the whole history of this as far as the airlines are concerned though this presentation is over 20 years old it's still outstanding even though we're talking airliners versus c-130s c-130s are considerably different animals they have the engines running at 100 percent with the props blowing the the thrust right over the top of the wings and you can get almost instant power out of the c-130s versus the long spool up time at this of the jet airliners but some of the science behind wind shear remains the same and the understanding of it and the technology has improved considerably in the airline industry regarding wind shear detection and prevention since this video was made thanks so much for your support especially the folks over on patreon that make this content possible as this as I've had two videos already this month demonetized by YouTube. <sighs> but um, we'll still keep them going over here on Patreon. Thanks so much for your support. We'll see you here.